We've spent the last few episodes going through the basic biography of Lee Harvey Oswald's life from the time he was born until the time he joined the Marines, including several instances of discrepancies with the documents and the witness statements that call into question the official timeline of schools that Oswald attended, houses where he lived, and jobs that Oswald worked. In this episode, we begin our analysis of Oswald's time in the Marines. We'll continue to unpack the major documented moments in Oswald's biography, like when he shot himself in the arm in Japan, and when he freaked out and started shooting at nothing in the woods in Taiwan. We'll also cover even more discrepancies with the documents and the witness statements that raise questions about the Warren Report timeline for Oswald's life. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. This is Solving JFK. I'm your host, Matt Crumpton. Lee Harvey Oswald's mom said that he had been studying the Marine Corps manual continuously ever since he dropped out of Warren Easton High School. So it's no surprise that Oswald joined the Marines as soon as he could. Both of his brothers, John and Robert, had previously joined the military. Lee was following in their tracks. After signing a three-year enlistment contract, Oswald reported to the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego on October 26, 1956, about one week after he had turned 17 years old. He requested to be given the duty of aircraft maintenance repair, which is what he was assigned. Oswald's military career began in San Diego, where he attended boot camp and was trained to use weapons. San Diego is also the place where Oswald was given his first weapons test, where he received a score of 212 with an M1 rifle, which was barely enough to qualify for the middle ranking of sharpshooter on a marksman sharpshooter expert scale. Oswald left San Diego in January of 1957 for Camp Pendleton, California, where he attended training with the same eight-man squad he had previously been with at boot camp in San Diego. Those eight Marines in training all shared the same tent at Camp Pendleton, and the only one of them who was interviewed by the FBI was Alan Feld. None of these Marines were ever interviewed by the Warren Commission. Feld said that Oswald continually discussed politics and that he was left-winged. Feld also said that on five different occasions, when the members of the eight-man squad had leave, that all of the squad went together to either Tijuana or to Los Angeles. But Oswald never went with them and always did his own thing. The only other person from Camp Pendleton who recalled Oswald and was interviewed by the FBI was Sergeant Donald Goodwin, who supervised a group of 20 men, which included Oswald. Goodwin told the FBI that Oswald was a radio communicator and that he, quote, owned or had the use of a private automobile and spent a lot of time and effort reupholstering the interior. Now, this is interesting because we know that Lee Harvey Oswald could not drive a car and he didn't own one. We also know that Oswald's job was not in radio communications. It was in aircraft maintenance. So what's going on here with Sergeant Goodwin's statement? I'm not sure, 
but it conflicts with the other evidence. Sergeant Goodwin says that he was with Oswald during the entirety of the 90 or so days that Goodwin spent at Camp Pendleton. In June of 1957, Goodwin was transferred to another division, and Oswald was still at Camp Pendleton when he left. Goodwin's recollection of the dates, combined with the Marine Corps unit diaries for Goodwin, sets the stage for yet another conflict and the timeline for the whereabouts of Lee Harvey Oswald. Warren Commission Exhibit 1961 provides a list of all of Oswald's assignments while he was in the Marines, and that document says that Oswald arrived at Camp Pendleton on January 20th, 1957, and then left for training at a base in Jacksonville, Florida on February 26th, 1957. But remember, Sergeant Goodwin puts Oswald at Camp Pendleton in June of 1957. And he's not the only one who disagreed with the Warren Report timeline. Alan Feld told the FBI that he was with Oswald at Camp Pendleton in March, April, and May of 1957. The Marine Corps unit diaries that list the names of the Marines in each unit and their whereabouts says that Feld arrived in Jacksonville in May of 1957, which confirms the timeline for Feld's statement to the FBI. In addition to Goodwin and Feld's statements and the corresponding Marine Corps unit diaries, Oswald himself provided a handwritten statement about his background to the Dallas police when he was arrested. In that statement, Oswald said that he served at Camp Pendleton from April to May of 1957. So the statements from Goodwin, Feld, and Oswald himself are all in conflict with the timeline for the Warren Report. Clearly, There is a discrepancy between CE 1961, the Warren Report's official timeline, and the recollections of Donald Goodwin and Alan Feld, both of which are bolstered by the actual Marine Corps unit diaries, which showed that they were, in fact, where they said they were at the times they said they were there. We also have the statement from Oswald himself. Now, I'm not sure what any of this means at this point, But I do find it a little strange that all these timeline conflicts have never been reconciled. After Oswald left Camp Pendleton, the Warren Report says that he attended Aviation Fundamental School in Jacksonville, Florida from March 18th through May 3rd of 1957. During his six weeks in Jacksonville, he finished 46th in his class of 54 and was promoted from private to the rank of private first class. Next, Oswald was stationed at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, where he would learn about aircraft surveillance and the use of radar. Daniel Powers was Oswald's direct superior while he was at Keesler. Powers' first impression of Oswald was that he was somewhat of a loner. He was meek and could easily be led, and his general personality would alienate the group against him. He was known as the frail little puppy in the litter and was nicknamed Ozzy Rabbit because of his meekness. Powers told the Warren Commission that Oswald would usually go back to New Orleans about two hours from Biloxi every weekend. At this time, Oswald's mom was living in Fort Worth, Texas. The only person Oswald knew well enough to stay overnight in New Orleans would have been his aunt, Lillian Moret. When we examine Power's statement, it yet again raises inconsistencies between the documents and the Warren Report conclusions. Remember, CE 1961 says that Oswald was in Jacksonville from March 18th to May 3rd. Then, Oswald took a train directly to Biloxi with Daniel Powers and other Marines. CE 1961 then says that Oswald was stationed in Biloxi from May 4th 
to June 19th. But Oswald's aunt, Lillian Moret, told the Warren Commission that Oswald visited her briefly in late April of 1957 on a Saturday. They went to lunch and Oswald told his aunt that he was going to be stationed at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi. Then, she dropped him off near the Custom House by the river. She added that Oswald never came to visit or wrote any letters when he was at Keesler. This adds even more confusion because Oswald was gone most weekends according to his supervisor, Daniel Powers, yet Lillian Moret says that he wasn't visiting her on those weekends. Once again, we have a discrepancy in the timeline. The train from Jacksonville to Biloxi was a straight shot. There was no time off between the two bases. So it's not possible that Oswald could have gone to visit his aunt in April of 1957 unless he drove there from Jacksonville to New Orleans and back, which is 450 miles each way. But given that Oswald said nothing to his aunt about Jacksonville, and there's no evidence that Oswald had access to a car, that doesn't seem to make any sense either. The easiest thing to do with all this information would be to simply write off Lillian Moret and say that she's wrong about the date of this visit. But she's actually looking at Oswald's diary to refresh her recollection while she says that. Some clarity can be provided by looking at the Warren Commission testimony of Lillian Moret. Commission counsel Albert Jenner gave Moret a document, which he said was CE 540, and she had this document in front of her during the following exchange. Jenner. Commission Exhibit 540 has a series of pages purporting to be photostatic copies of the diary or the memoirs of Lee Harvey Oswald written in his hand and found by Dallas police in his room. Lillian Moret. Well, here's one that says he was... You see, when he stopped in that Saturday, you know, we didn't know where he was going, but he said he was going to be stationed at Keesler Field. Now, I tried to find the diary that Lillian Moret was referencing when she said, here's one, because it sounds like she's referring to a specific diary entry of Lee Harvey Oswald. It would be great to know what she was looking at that made her say, here's one. But unfortunately, Jenner described this as CE 540, and the exhibit that is CE 540 is definitely not a diary. So in addition to the question about where Oswald was on weekends in Biloxi, and whether he actually visited his aunt in New Orleans before going to Biloxi, we have major inconsistencies in the marine records themselves as pointed out by the Warren Commission testimony of Daniel Powers. When Powers showed up for his Warren Commission testimony, he brought his actual written travel order documentation with him to the interview. Powers then read into the transcript a few key identifying numbers. 3383rd Student Squadron. Course number AB27037. Class number 08057, Military Occupational Specialty 6747. The problem is that these numbers that were in the document that Powers read to the commission do not match the same numbers for Lee Harvey Oswald that are in the Warren Commission volumes as Folsom Exhibit 1. Specifically, On page 119, Oswald's orders dated May 27th of 1957 listed the course number as AB27330, not 27037. The class number was listed as 24047, not 08057. Also, on Oswald's student summary of technical training document for Keesler, It says that he was in Military Occupational Specialty 6741, not 
6747 and that he was in the 3380th Student Squadron, not the 3383rd. Now, either Daniel Powers was just making up random numbers from the document in front of him and lying to the commission, or we have yet another confusing situation of the evidence not lining up with the other known facts. I can't think of any good reasons why Oswald's paperwork wouldn't match up with his superior's paperwork that was about Oswald from the same period of time. Can you? On July 9th, 1957, Oswald reported to the Marine Air Corps Station in El Toro, California to prepare for a deployment to Japan. He departed from San Diego for Yokosuka, Japan on August 22nd on the USS Bexar and arrived in Japan on September 12th. From September 12th through November 20th, Oswald served at the Atsugi base, which had 117 Marines. Atsugi hosted the Joint Technical Advisory Group, which was an operations base for the CIA in the Far East. The U-2 spy plane was based out of three locations, two in the Middle East and one at Atsugi, Japan. Oswald was responsible for actually guarding the U-2 in the hangar. The U-2 flew over not just Russia, but China as well. This information about the Chinese U-2 flights was not a well-known fact. About a month after arriving in Japan, on October 27th, Oswald shot himself in the left elbow when he dropped a 22 caliber Derringer, a non-military issued gun that was illegal for Oswald to possess, which Oswald had apparently acquired before getting on the ship. Paul Murphy, a Marine who bunked in the cubicle next to Oswald's, heard the shot. He rushed in and found Oswald sitting on the locker and looking at his arm. Without emotion, Oswald said, I believe I have shot myself. This story was confirmed by four other Marines who were nearby, George Wilkins, Richard Sear, Jerry Pitts, and Robert Ogg. After Oswald accidentally shot himself in the arm, he then spent two weeks at the hospital recuperating from his injury. Then, he was sent back with his unit for a November 20th, 1957 trip to the Philippines for four weeks. During this time, Oswald was promoted to the rank of corporal while he was assigned to a temporary radar station near Subic Bay in the Philippines. On April 11th of 1958, after Oswald had returned to Atsugi, Japan, He faced a delayed punishment for the incident that he had with the Derringer from almost six months earlier. He was court-martialed and found guilty for having the unauthorized gun, which was only discovered because Oswald accidentally shot himself. Oswald lost his recent promotion to corporal and was sentenced to 20 days of hard labor, which was suspended so long as Oswald stayed out of trouble. Now, unfortunately for Oswald, he wasn't able to maintain good behavior for very long. On June 20th, Oswald almost got into a fight with Sergeant Miguel Rodriguez, who Oswald thought had been responsible for him having to work kitchen duty in the Philippines, which Oswald hated. While they were at the Bluebird Cafe in Yamato, Japan, Oswald accidentally spilled his drink on Sergeant Rodriguez, which led Rodriguez to stand up and shove Oswald. At that point, Oswald, who admitted that he was rather drunk, asked Rodriguez if he wanted to take it outside to go fight. This incident resulted in Oswald being court-martialed yet again on June 27th for using provoking words to a non-commissioned officer. He was sentenced to 28 days of hard labor and a $55 fine. He also had to serve another 20 days of hard labor, which had previously been suspended from the accidental Derringer discharge incident. 
The next stop for Private First Class Oswald was most likely Taiwan. Although, as you will see, Oswald's time in Taiwan is the most disputed period of time during his Marine service. One night, while on guard duty in Taiwan, Oswald began firing his rifle at shadows in the woods. When Lieutenant Charles Rhodes reached him, Oswald was slumped against a tree, shaking and crying. He told Rhodes that he had seen men in the woods, that he challenged those men, and then he started shooting at them. As Oswald was walked back to his tent, he kept repeating that he could no longer bear being on guard duty. Oswald was then sent back to Japan to recuperate, ultimately returning to Atsugi on October 5th, 1958. Lieutenant Rhodes said that he thought Oswald staged the entire episode on purpose just so he could be sent back to Japan, which it turns out is exactly what happened. This incident in Taiwan is not mentioned in the Warren Report. All that the Warren Report says about this period of time is that Oswald left at Sugi for the South China Sea on September 14th, he was in Taiwan on September 30th, and then he returned to Atsugi on October 5th. There is no discussion at all of Oswald shooting in the woods and freaking out. That anecdote apparently became famous from Edward Epstein's book, Legend, The Secret World of Lee Harvey Oswald. Gerald Posner and Vincent Bugliosi repeated the Taiwan guard duty freakout story from Epstein's book, in each of their popular books defending the Warren Report. Now, despite the Warren Report claiming that Oswald was in Taiwan, and despite Posner and Bugliosi embracing the story of Oswald shooting in the Taiwanese woods, there is reason to believe that Oswald never traveled to Taiwan at all. On September 16th, 1958, Two days after the Warren report says that Oswald left at Sugi for Taiwan, medical records show that Oswald saw the senior medical officer at Atsugi, Captain Duranian, about a painful urethral discharge that he was having. Captain Duranian diagnosed Oswald with gonorrhea and prescribed three days of penicillin. Oswald was again treated for gonorrhea on September 20th September 22nd, September 23rd, and on September 29th. All of these medical records also have Oswald's identification number on them, 1653230. So we know it's talking about Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay, so what's going on here? Oswald had gonorrhea and he received treatment for it in Atsugi from September 16th through September 29th. These medical documents are not compatible with the timeline of Oswald's whereabouts provided by the Warren Report in their Commission Exhibit 1961, which shows all the locations and the corresponding dates of where and when Oswald served in the military. The problem here is that there's strong evidence that Oswald really was in Taiwan at the time, just like the Warren Report says. In addition to CE 1961 and the witnesses that author Edward Epstein interviewed, we have the Marine Corps Unit Diary, number 151-158, which shows that Oswald and his unit departed from Japan on September 14th aboard the USS Skagit. Once he was in the Soviet Union, Oswald told journalist Priscilla Johnson that he had spent time in Formosa while he was in the Marines. Formosa is another way to say Taiwan. On top of that, there are multiple declassified naval messages saying that Oswald served in Taiwan. Putting all of this together, we have medical documents that show Oswald was receiving medical care in Atsugi on five occasions during the time that he was supposed to be at sea or in Taiwan. But we also have lots of internal military documents showing that Oswald was in fact in Taiwan, which is what the Warren Report relied on. 
We then have the memorable story about Oswald freaking out and shooting in the woods, which is the cherry on top that is supposed to show that Oswald was in Taiwan. Here's where the was Oswald in Taiwan or wasn't he saga gets even wilder. In 1978, investigators for the House Select Committee on Assassinations found out about the medical records showing Oswald receiving treatment for gonorrhea in Atsugi when he was supposed to be in Taiwan. So HSCA Chief Counsel Robert Blakey wrote to Secretary of Defense at the time, Harold Brown, and asked, quote, During which periods was Oswald separated from his units overseas because of hospitalization? Blakey then explained the basis of the question, which was the conflicting evidence between the medical records showing Oswald in Atsugi and the Marine Corps unit diaries, which showed that he was in Taiwan at the same time. A few weeks later, the Department of Defense responded by saying, quote, Oswald did not sail from Yokosuka, Japan on September 16, 1958. He remained at Naval Air Station at Sugi as part of the MAG-2 rear echelon. Relying on this letter from the Department of Defense, the HSCA found that Oswald never went to Taiwan at all. The HSCA said, quote, It does not appear that he spent any time in Taiwan. This finding is contrary to that of the Warren Commission, but the commission analysis apparently was made without access to the unit diaries of Oswald's unit. This whole question of was Oswald in Taiwan is one of the most mysterious topics surrounding his time in the military. There's overwhelming evidence that he was in Taiwan. We have the unit diaries, the statement from Lieutenant Rhodes who found Oswald after he had shot into the woods, Oswald's own references to being in Taiwan from talking to reporters, and several declassified Navy communications about Oswald's background once he was in the Soviet Union. They all say that he was in Taiwan. On the other hand, we have just a few pages of medical records showing that Oswald was still in Atsugi. The notion that the Department of Defense would overrule the Warren Commission to the HSCA and say that Oswald never went to Taiwan at all makes absolutely no sense to me given all of the competing evidence that establishes that he was in Taiwan. Now, as I always do when I'm presented with a fact that seems to be too fantastical, I went to Vincent Bugliosi and Gerald Posner to see how they dealt with this issue. Neither of those authors mentioned the fact that the HSCA, because of a letter from the Department of Defense, said that Oswald was never in Taiwan. Now, Bugliosi actually works the Atsugi medical records into the timeline of Oswald going to Taiwan, and he assumes that the medical records are from treatments that were done when Oswald was either in Taiwan or when he was at sea. Now, I don't find Bugliosi's theory to be supported by the evidence for a few reasons. First, the medical documents say MAX-1, which is Atsugi. Second, there's a stamp on all the medical records at issue that says Navy 3835, which was the base number for Atsugi. Presumably, if Oswald was stationed somewhere else or he was on the USS Skagit when he received the treatment, it would have listed the actual location on the document. Another reason to doubt Bugliosi's interpretation is the Warren Commission testimony of Captain George Donabedian, who was brought in to help clarify the meaning of Oswald's records. During that testimony, Donabedian said, quote, On September 16, 1958, Oswald evidently went to one of the outlying dispensaries and they said, Send to the main side for smear which means he was sent to the mainside dispensary to get the smear taken. 
In military parlance, the main side complex is the one that is closest to the main base. This testimony makes it clear that Oswald initially sought treatment at another military clinic that was not the main side clinic, and that he was then sent to the main side clinic in Atsugi on September 16th. But most notably, I doubt Bugliosi's interpretation because the official position of the government is now that Oswald was never in Taiwan. Now, why would the government take this position in the face of so much evidence to the contrary? I don't know. It seems like they must have a reason to believe that Oswald really was in Atsugi. Otherwise, the HSCA and the Department of Defense would have simply adopted Buliosi's position that Oswald received the medical care while he was in Taiwan or at sea. But what I keep coming back to is, what about all of the other documents? What about Lieutenant Rhodes' testimony? Something must have happened in Taiwan with Oswald. Are we supposed to just forget that the other evidence exists? Next time on Solving JFK, we continue to examine the remainder of Oswald's time in the Marines, including more discrepancies with the records and a tiny little college in the Swiss Alps where Oswald applied to go to school. If you heard anything that you believe is out of context, or if you have additional information to offer, you can let us know at solvingjfkpodcast at gmail.com. Please provide citations to the record for any fact that you're relying on. For transcripts, sources, and official podcast merchandise, visit SolvingJFKPodcast.com. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thanks for listening. Visit SolvingJFKPodcast.com for more information. I'm getting out of here.